So today I'm going to talk about the body and exploring what is a normal body. And people have already had a go at me on Facebook saying, what do you mean? How can you talk about a normal body? And I said, well, that's what we're looking about. We're looking at. So I'll, I'll, begin, I'll begin the slides. Okay, and then if I see people are coming in, hopefully we can we can catch them as they are. So today we're looking at the normal body, and I put this um, mannequin up here because when I was teaching at Brighton and Sussex Medical, they used the mannequ mannequin to try out uh, techniques. And so I wanted to look at what's a perfect body. Is there such a thing as a perfect body? And have we got it? Um, wanted to look at what's normal and different kinds of healing in Africa and causes of ill health. So that's what I wanted to look at today. And I'm just wondering, what's, what's your idea of a perfect body would you like to unmute yourselves um what do you what do you think is a is a perfect body i don't think there is one one you feel comfortable in I think it com it depends on where you come from. I think yeah. it depends on where, you know, I used to do a lot of work with um, young girls about sort of appearance, et cetera, et cetera. And it was sort of, um, I used to call it the clone years. So everybody wanted to be, look the same, dress the same, have the same hairstyle. And it was about sort of fitting into that community. You know, it was very important for, for young young girls, especially to, to fit into that sort of norm. Um, but I think as you grow older, you, you know that sort of what's the, the term? Beauty is, in, beauty is the, in the eye of the beholder. Um, but there's there's lots of pressures for, for especially young people, young young women and men to... to um, look a, a specific way and I've seen sort of um, things on Facebook or social media about th this is this is a representation of um, what looks good for um, somebody who lives in the UK or lives in Sudan or you know and there's different sort of forms whether or not you you know stereotypical I'm beautiful UK's um, thin size size six where in another country, you look more affluent, you know, if you've got a bit more sort of meat on your bones like me, you might, you, you know, that that may come across as being more affluent or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so it's different places and different countries. Thank you again. Has anybody else got any idea of what the perfect body might be? Well, my definition is the one you feel comfortable in. The one you feel comfortable in. I think one without cellulite, ideally, for me. <laughs> <laughs> just being honest there, if I could just lose the cellulite, that would be nice. Just, you know. Just a little bit. Quite a lot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's also it's also quite contentious whether it's a white body or a brown body or a black body. There's all kinds of um, normal that um, depends on time and place. So, Is cellulite popular anywhere, Natalie? You probably cellulite. know. Cellulite. No, I think as as Gainer says, it, there's there's fattening houses in certain parts of the world where um, it's desirable. 
um, to, to be a certain size. So. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I, it was a very long time ago, but I was very fortunate to um, go to Jamaica. I'll never, I'll probably never go, get there again. I don't have the money. But I went to Jamaica on holiday on a beach and met a family from Hawaii. And the little girl who, you know, out the mouths of babes, she was only probably four or five. And she was fascinated by my skin colour because she'd not, you know, because I've got quite a lot of moles on my arms and she was, she was pressing on, on my arms because she'd never seen it before. She was mesmerised. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and as a teenager, having these, these lots of moles, etc., I was very self-aware that I looked a little bit different to, to the other girls of my age. Yeah, so time and place yeah. um, make, makes things different. So that's the perfect body. And I've got an example here from, um, it was a sculptor. He, he made this sculpture. Um, for Trafalgar Square in London and specifically people who were amputees or, or disabled but he claimed that they were portraits of whole people and people used their free will to overcome the biological realities um, to become heroes and Rumi the um, 13th century Persian poet he said, your body is woven from the light of heaven. Are you aware that it, <coughs> excuse me, that its purity and swiftness is the envy of angels and its courage keeps even devils away? And these pictures are from Switzerland, or admittedly in 2013. It was a charity who created mannequins um, in the form of people's real bodies because um, they wanted to raise awareness that um, no one has a perfect body and he displayed them in a Zurich high street um, and there's a, a lady here showing the mannequin perfectly um, reflects her body shape and then we look at uh, thalidomide and it was a drug that we've heard, heard about that was developed by a German pharmaceutical company for morning sickness. It was only sold for four years, um, but because of it, 10,000 babies were born with disabilities. And then when there was a documentary called Nobody's Perfect in 2008, um, people were asked about their condition, but they accepted their condition. They didn't let it get in the way. Um, um, and they came from politics, sport and acting. So the, the form that they had was um, normal to them. And I wanted to talk a bit about, I'm just going to check because it looks like there's people in the waiting room. Okay. Excuse me. Hello, Toby. Lovely. Hello, Toby. Nice Hi. to see you. Hi, Nessie. <laughs> I'm over. The, I wanted to talk about, um, intersex children because in the 1950s in the hospitals the staff would assign gender really fast if a baby had ambiguous gender so gender reassignment took place without the child's consent and then in 1993 um, the intersex society of america um, addressed the needs of people who felt harmed 
by this reassignment, by this choosing one gender or the other. And they said um, that we should accept their human diversity. Um, and it wasn't a disease that they were born different. They were just born different. And in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that the psychiatrists used, um, it said later, intersex is neither a medical nor a social pathology. So Germany recognises the third gender and France doesn't. And it seems there are quite a few people that are born intersex or with the third gender. So people, we can't assess whether they're born as male or female. And so hermaphroditism is tissues from ovaries and testicles are present and a child may have parts of both male and female. So in the past, it was the parent's decision to raise a child as male or female within the first days of its life. And uh, this person, she doesn't, he doesn't um, identify as male or female, but works as an activist against surgery, saying that surgery without consent is wrong. Sorry, I'm just going <coughs> to, excuse me, I seem to have a cough today. So non-binary people are people who feel they're neither boy nor a girl. And it may be 1% of the population here. But in the UK, non-binary people have no definition according to law. And there can be feelings of isolation and suicide if people around are not supportive. And parents do mourn the, the child that they thought they have. Um, and now the Human Rights Act from 1998 protects privacy and dignity. These are two people who claim to be non-binary and that's their, their normal. And in the United States, the ancient indigenous civilizations, um, hermaphrodite people were called two spirit and were really respected. And they were considered as doubly blessed by um, having the spirit of both a man and a woman. And the changes occurred when the Europeans went in with their concept of sin and homophobia. And they ran two spirit powwows each year, except not this year because of the, um, the virus. This is uh, my colleague, Krista Moot. When I met her, she was a man and a lovely film has been made about her life that she decided to change gender when she was 60 and she felt she had gender dysphoria since she was a child and then transitioned when she was 60 but she kept her job in Switzerland and this film um, follows her her life to Bangkok Bangkok to have the surgery. It's this really gentle showing. And for gender dysphoria, there's all kinds of explanations um, beyond biology. So that it can be um, that there's genetics or hormones or chromosomes in the womb. Sorry, I'm going to go back. Um, or insecticides, there's all kinds of um, explanations about gender dysphoria. There's all kinds of psychological explanations about unresolved childhood issues. Um, Can I ask what the chromosomes in the womb is? The chromosomes in the say, womb. Say that again, Toby. What is chromosomes in the womb? What does that mean? Um, if I'm not sure okay if there's some kind of biological change 
but that's just one of the the models and then the psychological model is um, there as well and then in the west we thought it was a psychiatric condition for for years um, it was classified as gender dysphoria disorder but then it was re reclassified and then there's a spiritual theory of causation of gender dysphoria which can be spirit possession by someone of a different gender or when the veils of incarnations are thin between the worlds people may have had the, the chosen gender in a previous life there was a belief that spirit possession only occurred in Southeast Asia, but the psychiatrist even um, Ian Stevenson, um, he looked into it and he said it occurred elsewhere. The painting is by Sud Susan Seddon Boulay. I am just going to check because I believe other people are waiting. Hold on a minute. Okay. So this cartoon is, is looking at risk and illness. And it's the statue of death asking a woman, are you flirting with me? I wanted to look at beliefs about what causes illness and there she's got a cigarette and a gun and a knife and she's drinking and taking drugs and uh, you can see a stick of dynamite here so the specter of death is saying are you flirting with me because I want to look at here what do we believe causes illness because there's all kinds of uh, different beliefs so I just wanted to ask you a question. What kind of beliefs have you heard about that cause, that cause illness? Are we talking about mental illness? So well, say, or... <laughs> it, even physical illness because you can say oh well if you go out without a coat on or you you go out without your your hat on there's all kinds of beliefs about why we get um physical illness as well thank you metal rabbit for writing chromosomes in the womb is the genetic code that writes the attributes of the child thank you for for saying that has anyone else heard any beliefs about um, Ill, not just mental illness, but uh, I just wanted to sort of say what Ma Margaret was saying really about um, you know mental illness and the fact that um, you know lots of people but there is a shift lots of people um, presume it's a chemical imbalance in your brain um, and the fact that there's no suggesting evidence to prove that um, it is it is life events it is trauma it is social um, for people to have you no know, experience sort of depression or anxiety or however they feel uh, so in terms of sort of you know, there, there must be something seriously wrong with you if you've got a mental illness, something something not right, but actually there's a bigger picture. Yeah, so we need to look at the bigger picture. Margaret, have you found that, that we need to look at a bigger picture? Oh, beliefs around why people end up poorly. I mean, for, for a long time, I had no idea that childhood trauma, I mean, I understand it now, but I didn't. And as a nurse, I was never taught that at all. Um, so, and I had no idea that people's cultural beliefs and backgrounds could have such an impact. So, you know, karma, for example, believing that somebody's having a hard life now and is ill now because of what's happened previous lives, that was new to me with my cultural beliefs, the Irish Catholic kind of upbringing. 
totally different set of beliefs around all sorts of things. Prayer, for example, was a solution or, or punishment. Um, yeah. Why do we get ill? Often it's that. I, I, lately, I've been working with a lot of people who think everything happens for a reason. So, you know, if all this bad stuff's happening, it's meant to be. That seems to be a big one lately for me. A lot of people I've worked with. Yeah. Yeah. Metal Rabbit, have you got something you want to add? I'd quite like to say that. Um, I'd quite like to say that I think that maybe unconscious decisions to become ill could be a, a person can make those at a very deep level as a response to all kinds of things. You know, it could be trauma or it could be a conversation you have with someone and they persuade you that such a thing is inevitable. And then you, you, you know, it could be a whole network of uh, decisions that happen in, in the society around you or in early childhood. And you, and you have a model of who you are deep inside that may have the may come up with ideas that make you attack your body you know uh, in a way that um, can make you ill so that's what i've been thinking recently yes yeah, so things like take taking risks like excuse me if anybody's smoking drinking going skiing hiking up mountains all those kind of things that, that also you could hold the idea of of sickness and main, maintain it and we'll we'll come on to that um shortly thank you thank you for what you're saying um metal rabbit rupert sheldrake and family constellations and uh where one person is morphogenetically shifting the family um, morphogenetic disposition. So there's a variety of beliefs that cause illness and when we looked at it there's all kinds of um, lay beliefs about stress and worry and tension and there's the environment, if the environment's polluted, whether it's real or not. And then there's risk behaviours like uh, smoking and diet and skiing. Or there's beliefs about inheritance, that if your mother or father had whatever, then you will die of the same uh, disease. My father decided that he would die at 87 because his father did. And now he's 90, so he's a bit confused that that, uh, that didn't go. And there's beliefs about mechanical and electrical failures in the body or, or blockages and toxins. And there's also beliefs about reward, that if you do this, if you take proper care of yourself, if you wear a coat when you go out, um, you'll be rewarded um, with good behaviour. So there's a belief that um, ill health is a consequence of inappropriate behaviours. And then people make moral judgments about the sick, um, whether they've got cancer or AIDS or addiction. And then lastly, there's the supernatural causes of the position of planets, karma, um, ancestral ghosts, um, that you're finding people of um, every ethnicity but i think we need to know about it and i was interested in what what's the public perceptions of anatomy and it seems that when you're poorly um, it seems that the organ of the body that feels poorly feels larger to you than uh, than the others and the stomach area may be the whole of the ab abdomen so organs may increase in size, or there's the belief that the body's a machine. Um, so like a combustion engine or battery driven, and then the heart, um, the heart as a pump, or you have a nervous breakdown, um, and then machines need fuel. So they need food and drink and 
other remedies or you can repair if you've got something poorly like a joint you can have a pacemaker or a hearing aid or um, joints replaced so the body as a machine and there's the other one is the body as a plumbing model so where the body is like a series of um, tubes and pipes um, and then if you're healthy there's a good flow through the tubes um, and disease occurs when there's a blockage um, which results in retention um, the poison the poison the system and just shifting I wanted to look at whose models of health do we hold and looking at Western versus African health I met um, Credo Mutwa years ago when he came to London and he died a couple of months ago at the age of 98 and he had a particular perspective on Western models. And for example, there were in Rwanda, there was public healing, not this private one-to-one -one that we assume is the correct way in the West. So they, the people said, we had a lot of trouble with Western mental health workers who came here immediately after the genocide. And we had to ask some of them to leave. Um, they would take us one at a time into these little dingy rooms and have us sit around for an hour or so and talk about bad things. So the Western way of, um, of mental health with one-to-one -one counseling didn't, didn't suit at all. And also in Africa, the, when people became ill, um, they felt that the ancestors had been disturbed by their behavior and sickness. It was also if you'd quarreled with your family or if you'd broken a taboo or used um, water wrongly. And during a public ritual, it was normal for people to speak out exactly what was troubling them. So you'd, you'd speak all your, your troubles aloud. It wasn't just go to one counsellor and be reflected back at you. There'd be, be like some kind of family therapy. And it was normal at these times for all the hidden grudges um, to be spoken about. And it was believed a person couldn't get better until all the tensions had been expressed or confessed. And speaking these private matters in public allowed the angry spirit which caused the sickness a gateway to leave. But if we did that kind of thing in the urban situation in the West, I don't think it would be appreciated. So Turner suggested the purpose of healing rituals serve to consolidate village unity, stabilize personal relationships and alleviate body pains and misfortune. And I've got a question at the bottom here. In what way do we think this might be like family psychotherapy? Has anybody got any ideas that this public speaking, would it be like psychotherapy, family psychotherapy that we have in the West. Would that deal with the whole society or the local, so, so, the social group, uh, family therapy, it feels? It would be like it... It would be a tiny part of it maybe, I would have thought, maybe. Say it again? It would be like a part of the, the, the group ceremonies because your group ceremonies don't include just the family, is it? It's the whole, the whole village. It, it's the whole village. So everything is aired publicly. In a way, it might be similar to open dialogue that the psychiatrist Russell Razak has been promoting with the NHS. Yeah, I've had so that actually. You've, you've had experience of that? For a whole year I did that with my mother, yes, and my two brothers occasionally. And it was maybe a bit like that, but um, it was too limited to the number of groups that would, you know, the number of people, because it was just my family. So 
uh, but it was invited. You were invited to bring other people from your social network, not just the family. It's, it's the system, they call it. The system being, um, or your social, your, the entirety of your social the network. Kind of connections. Is that what you're saying, work? Sophia? Like it a network of people? Yeah. Yeah, that's what Open Dialogue calls it, isn't it? The network or network meetings. And can I ask you, do you find it more effective than one-to-one -one counselling? It's much better because, because the, uh, the, you've got a group of people who form a perception of you and they discuss their perception of you and that makes the, um, any, any kind of paranoia you have about individuals uh, kind of gets dealt with quite rapidly. Because if you have a paranoia about an individual, another psychoanalyst can be another individual and you just get in the same cycle of um, bad habits with them and it can it doesn't shift things nearly as well, I found. So, so that, that sounds good. Thank you, Toby. So it, different ways of working that is now reaching the West and becoming think, yeah. normalised. I think the, the experience I've had when we've um, we developed sort of a, a peer mentor program which allowed um, people, like-minded people with lived experience to come along and um, participate in a variety of different sort of groups depending on what they wanted, what they, they wanted to achieve, whether or not it was a sort of social setting where it was coffee and cake or did they want to learn something on mindfulness or did they want to do curious conversations? There was different elements to different different sort of um, support groups offered or long term conditions, and the outcomes there were were so much. Um, if, you, if you want to talk about measuring tools or whatever, the outcomes were so much better for those people that actually participated in peer support groups with with like-minded people lived experience sharing those ideas um becoming becoming a community and that understanding so that they weren't getting judged so for me if my career if that's what i'm going to say that was a massive achievement was those peer groups they were just absolutely unbelievable and people got so much from it never mind sitting in a one-to-one -one room with a, a professional no, that's that's good to hear. It it feels much more acknowledgement and less judgment and less hierarchy when it's a group of people. So staying in Africa and shifting a little bit, I wanted to look at um, being albino, albinism in Africa, which brings particular problems. And in some places they are assumed to be a curse and parents are encouraged to kill their albino babies. And it's a condition that suffers, um, it deprives skin, hair and eyes from melanin and the children are vulnerable to sun and bright light and many have poor eyesight and they say that the threat of violence is real as society doesn't see you as a human being and children are kidnapped and their body parts are used for charms to bring wealth and good luck so it's a it's a different set of beliefs but i know um when i was in sudan um there was a child who was really scared of me i think like you mentioned gaynor they hadn't seen someone with white skin before so they assumed i had no skin on at all which which was very frightening and there's various people who are activists um, challenging the old ways of albino uh, one is um, peter ash who wants to protect them 
from Albino. And in Tanzania, they say since 2000, 72 albinos were murdered with the trade in body parts, magical body parts. And so the government had to build shelters um, for the children to protect them. And there's a kind of silence around what happens to albinos. And Salif Keita, the, the singer, also challenges, also albino, also challenges um, being albino. And then there's people using body parts. Um, we've, we've seen it with albinos in certain parts of Africa and maybe it's stopped now. But there's also a trade in body parts from people who are poor um, and they give, they sell body parts to people in wealthy countries. So that in New Delhi, in India, um, there's a ring of people that harvest kidneys from poor laborers and use them for foreigners. Then the last couple of photos, I thought this would be interesting of incorruptible body where there was a Chinese statue um, with a thousand year old Buddhist monk inside. Um, in, the, in the Netherlands, they put it through a CT scan and it actually had um, a living dead human inside. And there's this question of, so what, what are the boundaries of a body? If a human consists of both physical and non-physical elements, some of them precede um, life and survive proceed birth and survive death. So there's all kinds of spiritist explanations. And I'm just wondering, wh where is your self? Where does your self end? Does it end at the boundaries of the skin? Um, and, and how does your body, um, the concept of body, align with your concept of self? So, so what, is, what is your self? Has anybody got any ideas of, of what their self is? Are we are we just the physical body? Are we breath? Are we what? What's our identity? Are we energy or vitality? What, what goes up to making a human being? Can't it be all of those things? We could be a mixture of all of those things and it'd be, um, we haven't got a concept for, that includes all of them, like body, mind, <coughs> Body, spirit, energy, for example, could all be aspects of the same thing. Yeah. I think with in terms of the identity, <clears throat> there is different elements to it, isn't it? It's sort of um, who you are sort of as a person, what are your beliefs, your values, your morals. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look at some people, especially in the Western world, think um having the identity of where you work what your profession is etc um yeah it's those it's those who am i what am, what is my purpose and and that might your identity changes sometimes as well as you as you grow older you know we we all have different hats you know some of us could be mothers some of us could be nurses um, you know, there's, there's different roles that we have throughout our sort of lives as well. What different, different times. So yeah. it, is, it, is it the occupation we have or is it the books that we read? What's, what's our identity?
Is, is it the breast? Um, Sorry, Sophia, what were you going to say? I was just thinking about kind of um, uh, identity as uh, being as relational. Because I think in the West, we, um, you know, we think that you're, we don't realise that actually a lot of ourselves is made up by the relationships that we're in. Yeah, so it's it's relationship, it's it's job if we have one, if it's <coughs> there's there's so many variables. And metal metal rabbit, what is it that you were saying in the chat box? You said energy is a crazy making construct which enforces an it punishment and punishes adherence to 3D physicality. Is, is that what you meant? Is my microphone working here? Yeah. Is my microphone working? It's difficult to hear. Hold on, let me get something to stick in here. Okay, thank you. And the, this painting is done by Alex Gray and he's got the bones and all the the veins and arteries but he's also got an energy around the body and swirling from the center of the child's head and swirling from the center of his head and this energy coming from his mouth as he speaks to the yeah. child so it's different perceptions on the energy of a person i think Alex Gray used to work in an anatomy laboratory in a hospital. So, and then he started having visions of what it meant to be human. Hmm. So can I ask you to unmute yourself and how did you find the topics that we looked at today? Mm. Mm. I always find whatever you're talking about really interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I always just come away. I always have thoughts about stuff the week after it sort of stays with me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is, is audio any better now? Say it again. Is my audio any better now? No. Yeah. Okay. It is? Yes, it's yeah. better. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to ask because I was having trouble with it. <laughs> no, we we can hear you now. We can hear Good. you. I got distracted. I forgot the question, so I'll get back to it. Okay, thank you. Next week, I want to look at mental health and different cultural ways of interpreting the so-called symptoms and we'll begin at the same time at five o'clock so thank you very much everybody for coming this week and i will see you next week bye 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 bye, bye. 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 thank you thank you Thank you. Bye.